Johnny and the folks next door I like it. Another the old pitch song. Uh, it's about when you get the tools for the people, for the young people. It's called the Banks of the Dee. I started a new on the banks of the Dee. I met an old man in this dress I could see. I sat down beside him and to me he did say, I can't get employment cause my hair is so gray. I am an old miner, it's fifty and six. If I could get lost, I would ruffle me cake. Drop them and sell them or give them away. I can't get employment for the heritage. Last Wednesday, me, to the reckoning an hour away, to the glory of the I was gonna strike for an end. I was getting the pay, I was walking away When it gave me the notice, cause me hair is done good I am an old miner, age 50 and 6 If I could get lost, I would ruffle me sick I'd ruffle them and sell them, or give them away I can't get employment till the hair is done gray. No all you young fellas, each year I'm heavily. If you get good places, well, it's just a day. If you were in a loud flat, you'd be filling all day. And at fifty and six, well, you're old and gray. I am an old miner, age fifty and six. If I could get lost, why I'd drop the lid. I'd drop the lid and sell them or give them away. It's hell about the madness time, and a fine time it was then, old. But our good wife got full of the mass, and she boiled them in a pan, oh. And the bar in the boat, oh, wheel, 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 and the bar in the boat, oh, wheel. The wind it blew for east and west, and it blew upon the floor, oh. Did all good man to our good wife. Get up and bar the door, oh, at the bar and the bulldog, wheel, 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 and the bar and the bulldog, wheel. My hand is in my shoes, bag, good man as you may see, oh, so should not be the father's seven years, I'll know be bar by me, oh, and the bar and the bulldog, wheel, wheel. They laid a path between themselves and fixed it firm and sure. That the one who spoke of farmer's words should rise and bar the door. And the bar and the bulldog will, 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 and the bar and the bulldog will. Two gentlemen had lost the road. At twelve o'clock of the needle, and I couldn't find a hoot in the hall, no coal, no candle light. Oh. And the bar and the bulldog wheel, 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 and the bar and the bulldog wheel. Now, whether this is a rich man's hoot, or whether it is a fool, oh, but never one would yell them speak for the bar and all the door. Oh. And the bar in the bulldog wheel, 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 and the bar in the bulldog wheel. Well, first he 
ตะไวพลอันเชื่อมเอตะบากุอันรู้บุคานเสียงเต้าจะเดินกันรู้บาดุอันละบารุณบุตรวิลวิลวิลอันละบารุณบุตรฮัลโหลเบลคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่เพื่อจะบอกเรื่องเกี่ยวกับคุณพ่อและอะไรต่างๆฉันขอให้คุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที่นี่นี่คือมิสเตอร์เบลเอลิยาคุณมาที
the demolition started, which you're going to see in the film. But before you watch the rest of the film, I'll just show you these two things. This, I'm very proud of these. Pride of place in my house. This is my dad's lamp with his token on, number 76. And this is my grandfather's lamps. And this is what we used at Harrington Colliery, which nobody called it. It was always called Kosher Pit, which is short for Nova Scotia because there were so many Scots worked there, including Jock Purden. So that's a little background as to why that film got made. Thank you. Stopping it there, that's that's Johnny Handel there, kind of in the middle of the of the picture. Um, so, Bill, do you do you do you know the other people who are on? Yeah. So that that's that Johnny Handel. That's Johnny there. That's his wife, Tom Gilfell, his companions. Yeah, with the glasses on there. I'm not sure who that is. That's Jimmy Irvin. Mm -hmm. uh, if you watch the rest of the folks coming in, you'll see lots of lots of people from the, the folk scene. Uh, okay, uh, including, as I say, Ed Pickford. Um, I'm trying. To, let's see. I think who else was there? I'm not sure, but I've just gone in to the crematorium when these folks were arriving. Uh, I think I would have been. Yes, I would have been 15 at the time of the funeral. Okay, Austin? We see at the end of the film the people who are who are in in, in you know in the funeral. Yeah. I'll leave that one to you. I'll just tap the road and check the sound out there. Ah, my dad worked here all his life. That's my dad, 45 John. 45 years. I mean, roughly 45 years anyway. That's my dad, John Elliot. And then he retired about 12 months ago. And he died last July. And as you can see, the pits died for them. Um, it was 300 years this pit was alive. And at one time, there was 1,400 men working here. Just a matter of oh, seven years ago. This is Harriton. 1961. Jack Elliott, his father and his grandfather spent their working lives here. Now Jack too has gone and the world of pit and village which brought men of his quality into being has gone as well. Except for one thing, the film camera. In 1961 I asked Jack to tell me in front of a camera what he'd learnt from life. Now Mrs Elliott and the family have given us permission to use the film in tribute to a man, a pit and a community. On this occasion, as we meet to think for a few moments of our friend Jack Elliott and to bid him farewell, it is for us, the living, to reaffirm that friendliness and sympathy with our fellow citizens that is the foundation stone of the good society and which was exemplified so clearly in the life of Jack Elliott. We seek the happiness and welfare of all humanity.
Jack was an atheist. This is William Griffin, a Newcastle city councillor, a humanist. For the best of all answers to death is the wholehearted enjoyment and affirmation of life while we are here. That affirmation was made consciously and cheerfully at all times by Jack. He would have thought it ironic that his death coincided with the passing of the pit where he and his family had always worked. Harriton Colliery. I was on the long wall fish for uh, 25 years, which is a long time, and you get used with the work, working on your knees. And uh, I was asked to take a, a, a job on a, a four foot six scene, which was quite different. An awkward height four foot six, because I'm six foot. And uh, well, I had to drill, cut. It was a sort of a composite uh, job. And I was drilling, and I happened to turn. It was wet in the bottom, uh, sticky. My feet stuck when I turned, but my back didn't. I had to stop. But I kept on walking my shift in that height. Never felt it much. Let's try to straighten up at the end of my shift. Oh, I've never experienced such pain in all my life. How the world I got out by, I never know yet. I was off work two years at uh, two operations. When I went to the hospital, uh, I was lying in bed, and this nurse came round on her rounds with a bottle of liquid stuff and started rubbing my hips. She says, what the world's this on your hips? This hard, thick skin, I says, were well, hard working corns. I says, by the way, what are you doing? She says, uh, I'm rubbing you for bed sores. I said, bed sores? Oh, Christ, I says, just tell you, shoe full of bloody coals in the air, I'll be happy, I can lie here all day. Well, the best of all answers to death is the wholehearted enjoyment and affirmation of life while we are here. When Jack Elliott died of lung cancer in July last year, he left a family as independent and characteristic as he was himself. Doreen, who works part-time at the local primary school, his only daughter, married with two children. To M, Jack's widow, the village has totally changed. Change of work and uh, more money is bound to have an effect. That it might mean a better job. There are three boys. Two followed their father down the pit, but the eldest, Peter, went into engineering. Born two years before the great Durham miners' strike, he grew up hating the mines, became a draftsman. The youngest, Len, was a fitter at the pit until it closed, found work in a Gateshead factory. The other son, John, took me to Harriton to see the end of the old Nova Scotia mine. These are the records that we had to keep when the pit finished. We were told, take all the records up to see them because they wanted. Look at them scattered all over the pit. Doug Jenkinson. These foremen now at uh, Dorden, that lad. Fourth East South Codger End, that's the tail end of a belt. Yo Baron Down Roller fitted. Second East Trunk, gear head. Spur wheel guard refitted. Lugs broken off, guard, new guard required. Now, funny enough, that district there was one of the wettest and most horrible districts in the pit. And the fellow that's in charge of the demolition was the old man that was in charge of that scene. There they are, as well. Six years' work for fitters and electricians. Daily records, all just lying scattered around here. In the corner. This is where we had the hot water system for the wash basins. Huh? Play with others. This is just me. Alan Grove and Scott, that been lying there since he left. He got a job with the water board that lad. He left the MCB when he when the pit closed. I remember the first time I saw my dad coming out the pit after I'd started here. Uh, this great big fella, all black, came up and asked me for a cigarette. And I had to look at him twice before I realised that it was my dad. With the death of the mine, I think you're going to get the death of a village at the same time. The 
which is a tragedy to me because it's such village life as it was then when my dad, when the pit was really in production, was, um, was such a wonderful thing. There was this uh, feeling of companionship that existed. And I remember feeling it even as a, as a band coming up to wait for me dad and even bringing his grand bands up to see him going down the shaft they thought it was a wonderful thing to see their granda moving up onto the onto the ramp and then disappearing into the cage that uh, it's a the the colliery she's talking about is is Harriton colliery which the miners always called kosher pit the school she's working in is not in Harriton Village because it, Harriton Village is such was a tiny little yeah. hamlet. The school she worked in was in Ballymow, yeah. where she lived, we lived, my grandma lived. Um, but it's kosher pictures talk about yes. So did you move from Harriton? Had you always lived in Burley? No. Um, when I was born, my mom is from Gateshead. So we lived in Gateshead until I was six, and then we moved to a colliery house in Fatfield, and we were in Fatfield until I was about 13, and then we moved from Fatfield into Brown's Buildings. So we were in the same street as my grandma. They were in seven, and we were in 26. And then the council built some new houses down from what's called York Road, and that is where you saw me Auntie Doreen. So she lived in York Road. So me dad, me auntie, and me grandma and granda all lived more or less on the same street. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. It's all just gone now, which is a pity. After I left school, I had a week's on the grass, and I started straight down the pit. Actually, my father wanted me to be an engineer or a mechanic. But uh, all my mates and friends were pit lads who I said, no, I'm going to the pit. And I'm going straight down the pit. And uh, I'll never forget my first day down the pit, not as long as I live. Uh, your first gear was a, a whip. You had to have a whip. And uh, you beat pork on your arm with your lunch in, as you call it your bottle in your pocket, off you would go to the pit, a man. I can remember every little detail of that first year, even to the lamp number, 566, bunny shiny oil lamp. Uh, me whip stuck down me belt, put up pitman. Now, as a... Oh, you've got that, he's got the lamp there. Yeah, Matter the of lamp, fact, this whip... It was a, a nuisance. The first pony I got to drive, I had two days training with a, an older chap. Two days training, and Jimmy the Galloway. He was the fastest, daftest, bloody Galloway ever I'd seen in my life. <laughs> a whip, I says, what the <coughs> hell? I says, I want somebody to stop this, but I never mind about making guns. Can you just pause it uh, there Jimmy, for a second, please? He, he, was the, he could catch pigeons. Just to explain, uh, the miners always called the pit ponies Gallowers, and that's because they came from Galloway in Scotland. So they actually called them Gallowa, but they're actually that breed of pony they used were actually from Galloway in Scotland, so that's where they got that name. I says, uh, I think I better leave this whip at home after this, or tie his legs with it. And my first pair, I think it was one pound, one the penny. It was easy to remember, all ones. Mm -hmm. Been a hell of a lot of ones since too, <laughs> believe me. Then it went up to about 25 shilling, and it... When, when you look at that, you know, that's a windy pick. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're heavy things to start with. Imagine doing that, you know, every working day. It didn't seem to get any uh, higher than that, till I started on the, the cutters as a cleaner back. For centuries, the fiery community of the Durham coal pits turned skinny boys into iron men. 
down underground in the deep seams, Pittman forged a unity from which they could laugh at life and fight for independence. You started young, picking on the coal screens, morning to dusk like a galley slave, until in the end accident or one of the old enemies got you, silicosis or hernia or rheumatism, 20, 30, 40 years later. But you stayed together all the time, and the Durham pits moulded a race of big hewers, small men mostly, but bold in their work, and bloody-minded in resistance to the owners. They are Harriton Miners in 1904. And you notice that um, not one of them had a mask on. My dad died of 100% pneumoconiosis. His, his, his lungs were solid. And you could see from that type of thing, there was no masks. The masters were tough people too. Tough and arrogant, and they fought back. Strike on one side, lock out on the other. Blackleg, the nastiest word you could shout. The man who worked while his mates stayed firm. In 1926, it was the Durham men who held out the longest, and the strike marked their memories like some long and terrible retreat. <coughs> the strike, well, we started off with a pound or two that we had saved up, not very much, and uh, about five, about five pounds, where we tried to make that spin out, where we didn't know how long the strike would actually last. But uh, the money sharp went, and then the coals went, we were seeking coals, firewood, anything that would burn to cook because there was, uh, you couldn't afford electric or gas. And uh, I've walked as far as uh, eight mile with a barrow, a couple of bags of coal on red right down Walridge up on the fells. And of course you pit heap, digging the heap. Walked in places there that we wouldn't dream of walking down the pit. Would have won danger money and the rest of it had to work for the coals, but uh, then things got progressively worse and worse, and uh, money ran out altogether. No more money left in the unions. We did get a wee bit help from abroad, the foreign the unions, uh, Russia and America. And we started with these vultures. Uh, the cooperative stores all of these vouchers. We got uh, eight shillings a week for to keep three of us. That's Mum and me and the wee laddie Peter. And uh, it was hard. Peter was just a baby, and uh, the problem was, of course, trying to uh, keep your morale going on an empty belly. It was a very, very difficult thing. And uh, I remember uh, being so awfully hungry one time. We got these vouchers on Friday, and they, we got the, uh, this was Thursday, and we'd had very, very little to eat. And I'd had uh, made some rice pudding for Peter with the last of the milk, the dried milk that was allocated to us because we had a baby. And um, there was a man, a fish man came round with herring, five a penny. And uh, we were awfully hungry, and we had only one halfpenny uh, in my purse at the time. And uh, we hunted around and hunted around and found another halfpenny. We bought the five herring, and it was the most delicious meal that I've ever eaten in my life. We had to cook it in water because we hadn't any fat, but we were so desperately hungry. And uh, we just took it out. We could have. I could have gone for another job, I dare say. I was asked many times, but I wouldn't. I said, no, I'm not. I'll be as bad as a black leg if I go get another job now. You know, there's a lot of talk about uh, the courage of black legs. But I, I often wonder how strong the courage would have been if they hadn't had police protection buses to take them back and forwards to work. But we never had a black leg mind at Harrington Corey, I will say that, where I was. But at Burley New Pit, and I was living at Burley at the time when I was first married. Uh, we did have black legs. Everybody gathered. The first ship that he worked to watch this man come home, it was the ice cream man that uh, Jack talked about. And there was a whole crowd gathered. And from the bus pulling in until the man got out and went to his home, there wasn't one solitary word. There was a deep, intense silence. And they just sort of moved forward very slowly, you know, and stopped. Of course, the police were there and wouldn't allow them to go too far. And it was, it was a frightening sort of a thing. 
uh, how the how the man could could carry on. He must have felt the feeling that the people uh, were going through, that they were they were aiming uh, for for betterment for his own class of people. Go ahead, don't for nine months. We often are criticised for being uh, bitter, but I'm bitter, and I think that everybody ought to keep a, a small feeling of bitterness inside them, uh, on whatever grounds, uh, industrial, uh, fighting, wars, anything, they ought to keep this little feeling of bitterness, otherwise they'll become so complacent and so contented that they'll become stagnant. But if they can only remember that little bit of bitterness that these things were and that these things could happen again. I suppose basically people fight uh, for these things, uh, excuse me, for their children, the children's children, but they know that uh, whatever good comes to their children, that it must affect all of the children of, uh, of working class people. Uh, I don't even uh, only mean working class people, but I think that uh, people in a, a higher uh, society has to be educated. They are appallingly ignorant, I think, about life actually. I don't have much uh, time for the middle classes. They're uh, what we're saying we have uh, around here. They have uh, lace curtains and kipper dinners. It's all outward show. The miner was always looked down on as something a uh, little less than human at one time. Uh, we always found that. I suppose uh, thought we had horns sticking out. But it's, uh, it's not so. There's some very, very gentle miners. It must be marvellous, Bill, to see, you know, your, your grandfather, you know. For, for me, uh, he was just my grander, yeah. you know, for a long yeah. time until uh, that LP happened and what have you. He was just my grander. I used to go in his cobbling shed. He used to throw me out because I couldn't knock a nail in straight to save my <laughs> life. I was banned from his cobbling shed, age six. <laughs> and I'm the black sheep in the family. They're all engineers, really handy. Oh. My brother, my dad, yeah. and I'm hopeless. But you'll not be surprised to know that my grandma was... Uh, fairly political <laughs> and she became a, a Labour councillor. Her hero was an Iron Bevan. Yeah. Uh, but my lasting image of my grandma is book. Uh, uh, yeah. She smoked incessantly. Everybody did. And you're going to see that the, what, the very soon. The faces, the, the place is just mm. enveloped in smoke because yeah. everybody smoked. But, but Bill, your grandma on there watching that, and she's on, she's on the, uh, on the film, uh, very articulate. Oh, know, absolutely. Well, you know, you know f f f she f was. To be a as she, she was very articulate. She took a real kind of uh, determination. She, like a lot of mining women or mining uh, children, the option really when you left school. And you left school at the beginning of the 20th century, age 12. If you uh, were lucky enough to get a job, you would maybe be working in a shop as a girl. The lads, it was straightforward. You went down the pit. But if you were a girl, you stayed at home to help your mom because don't forget, you know, pit families, 10 children sometimes. Or if you were lucky, you would get a job. And her job was a domestic servant in a big house in uh, Lofel. So in that big house, I think it was a doctor's house, she learned table manners, which were passed on to us or else, how to speak properly. She read and read and read and read. So she learned grammar, she learned how to speak. Um, yeah, so, and all that was passed down to us. Um, we, we were, she was a stickler for manners. And that was handed down to me dad, handed down to me, handed down to my children, because I'm very, very, very aware of good manners and bad manners. It's the first thing I notice about somebody, to be honest with you. Well, Ted had a terrific influence, not only on me dad, but 
And the family as a whole, I know I always used to think of my dad as a hero, because I always think that anybody that um, works hard for their living uh, has, a, has a dangerous job to me, he's much more of a man. And for all my dad was six foot two, to me he always seemed seven feet, because he worked down the pit. And I suppose this uh, influenced me, the, the fact that he worked hard. But I never used to be uh, frightened about my dad, I never had any fear of him. Uh, being killed down the pit because he always seemed such a capable um, man being able to take care of himself and he used to joke such a lot about the work that it took a lot of the dangers out of it for us um, whether he did this to um, sort of put our minds at ease I'll never know but to me pit work always seemed one big joke as far as my dad uh, was concerned the only time that I ever heard him, uh, there was any bitterness or uh, any really deep feeling was in the songs that he sang about the miners and then all the bitterness and all the pathos came out in these songs. Jowl, jowl and listen, lad, you'll hear that cold face walking. There's many a mara missing, lad. Because he wouldn't listen, lad. The deputy crawls from flat to flat. The putter arms the chumman. And the man at the face must know his place. Like a mother knows her young'uns. So jow, jow, and listen, lad. You'll hear that cold face walking. In these later years, the ability of Jack to get on with everyone has manifested itself in the growth of the local folk music movement, which has spread out from Jack, from Mrs. Elliot and the family, like a ripple in a pond into which a pebble has been cast until the movement has spread all over the North Country. See him on the, on the left? Um, no, it's Louis. It's no, that, that fellow you can see there with a the beard is a fellow called Graham Binless. And he used to lead a Cayley band and he was the caller. He looks very much like Lou Killen, but it's actually a fellow called oh, it's Graham, Graham it's Benless. Uh, and that's three tons. Graham's, Graham's um, wife there. And you're going to see, you're going to see uh, the two lads playing the pipes or across the chart and Colin Ross. You're going to see me as a 17-year-old in a minute. Breaking the low. That's me right there. Is that you? Oh, fancy. Were you, were you, were you drinking there, Bill? <laughs> that's that Graham Benner's wife. That's my cousin, Kay. Oh, it's not Graham Benner's wife. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear you put me right there. Can you just pause it there, please, Austin? Bertley Folk Club came about after my Uncle Peter and my Granda visited the bridge where the high-level ranters were in residence. And my Granda and my Uncle Peter were members one and two of the Bridge Folk Club. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as a result of going there, uh, they decided to form Bertley Folk Club. And at the Three Tons, well, it, it was the Red Lion, then it 
was the three tons. So you, this guy who's singing now is Don Stoko, who was a friend of the family. And he's singing one of the songs my granddad used to love, and it was written by Jock Purden, which is Farewell to Culture. And it's a, a wonderful song about the end of the pit and what happened to the miners having to go to Nottingham, some of them. Um, so this is called Farewell to Culture, and it was written by Jock Purden, who's on the banner with my grandfather. For sure the time is drawing near You'll have to change your lodgings, lads You'll have to change your beer But leave your picks behind you You'll never need them again And off you go to... Is that right? The Grim Bendler said? Yeah, it's Grim Bendler's. Nottingham, join Robin's merry men. Here, brave bold men of one by one, the older Durham pits have been closing for years. The village is turning into Tyneside factory estates. Jack and the boys talked about this six years ago, but no one knew then how soon it would come. Why, I, I mean, well, say you get in a pit village, you get the majority of the men working at the pit. They're all tied up. Possibly nine tenths of them working at the pit and at the same pit. Yes. Now, the fortunes of that colliery affect the fortunes of practically everybody yeah. in that mm -hmm. in that pit uh, in, in that village. If the pit's doing badly, the village is doing badly. Yeah. And this year, uh, you where everybody's everybody's doing badly and, and share that uh, yeah. the hard times. If the pit's doing well, well, everybody in the village is doing well and they enjoy that yeah. among themselves. Mm -hmm. Now then. If you close the pit and the, the go out to various industries, well, you get the picture where one industry is doing badly, which will affect perhaps a tenth yeah. of the village. Yeah. They're doing badly, they but the other nine tenths, they're doing well, you see, and they say, why, it's hard lines, they put where are, right? The majority of the village. The friendliness has always been there, and it always will be. This neighbourliness, your next door neighbour, two doors away, three doors away, you know everybody in the yeah. 30... At the houses of you. I think this this feeling of of, uh, of belonging, of a continuity with a past, a feeling of, of this is your kind. This is what we're losing, and this this idea of, of the world becoming smaller. But is it? Do do we honestly? Can we honestly say we feel neighbours with France? I don't think so. Not the sort of neighbourliness that Pop was talking about. This feeling of belonging. Uh, what should happen, it should start from a small community, go out yes. to a big community, That's right. go out to the country, go out to your next country, go out to the country beyond yes. that, and then that and comes a but that hasn't happened. There's something going wrong, because if you can, the, the next door neighbours in cities don't know each other. If you could take this village community and build it to a universal community. We cannot leave Jack today without making mention of his atheism and his free-thinking. These views were held without heat or rancor, but they were held firmly. And he would want us at this time to make this clear so that his passing would be in keeping with his living convictions. I found that uh, I just couldn't believe in the Bible anymore. I, I read the Bible through. And uh, it was just a lot of legends to me, so uh, I brought my children up without religion. Uh, four children, never one's been in any trouble, uh, morally, uh, the second to none. And I uh, had a wee bit of ostracism to put up with when uh, it became known that I was an atheist. Yes, yes. But uh, it didn't really bother, bother me at the finish. I used to teach my children this, if, if you hurt society, you're hurting yourself for a simple reason, you're a member of society. And that's the only way to teach children. Teach them, if they want to do a bad thing, let them do it, but don't kid yourself, it's a good thing. Get a bad thing make, make, make them face up to it, they're part of society. And whatever they do, it must have some bearing on the happiness, or otherwise, of uh, society. Uh, they did go to Sunday school occasionally, but I'll be 
perfectly honest. The reason they went to Sunday school was so that I could uh, be shot of them without the worry of them and do work or bake or cook for an hour. Mm. But um, whatever they learned at school and at Sunday school and they questioned the dad and I about when they came home, we explained to them our point of view and we left them entirely on their own to form their own opinions. Moral teachings are, have nothing to do with uh, with religion no, at all. No. But morals are social in the origin. I've always found. I respect your opinion. You respect mine. I respect your private property. I expect you to respect mine. If uh, if Christianity was as powerful as it's made out to be, there wouldn't be any damn policemen. We wouldn't need a police force. And if all Christians were as good as they make out to be. The prisons would be full of atheists, but that's not the case. They're full of Christians. <laughs> Westminster Abbey, April 1966. Two months before can he I, died, can you just Jack had been indicted for a second. That film that was made originally Private Lives, which was a BBC film, he wouldn't show it because of me grandfather's views on religion. So it was never aired nationally. Um, but five years on, things had changed by 1966, so they were able to combine that film with the later scenes, and it was actually broadcast on the BBC. I to sing at a folk song club in Islington. He and M came to see the Abbey in its 900th year. They liked the theme, one people, but not the monuments, Ooh. said Jack. The only war that's not celebrated here is the class war. War again? Yeah, it's always war. I wonder why they don't build a one too. Nine as it's been killed. Ooh, the lot of those been when no one never been found. Yeah, two enough. Jack saw all humanity as a single family. He saw the earth as one world in which we quarrel at our mortal peril. He believed that with care, with cooperation, and with sympathy, we could greatly improve human existence and happiness here on earth. This is to see life and to see it whole. And that, in one way, is the end of the story. The man is dead, the pit closed, the community transformed. This, of course, is how history seems when you live in the middle of it. The father always used to say, pit walks more than human. You've got to coax the coal along and not be riving and chewing. So jow, jow, and listen, lad, you'll hear that poor is walking. There's many a mara missing, lad, because he wasn't. So there you are, folks. That's a, an insight into my background, my family. Um, I used to show that film to my sociology students when I was teaching, particularly A-level students, because part of the course was about politics, and one of the parts of that was about class and class structure. So I didn't say anything about it. I just let them watch it. Well, no, no, I, I, I explained who it was because they were all looking at me when I, when I told them I was in a pub, age 17, they were all going, ah, oh, so. so, but it, it was interesting for them to see that um, because I had an interesting discussion with Uncle Peter once about that because 
determination of class was made by something called the Registrar General's Scale, which is about your job. And because I was a teacher, whether I liked it or not, I was middle class. And Uncle Pete was middle class, which he hated being told. So uh, we had some really interesting discussions about that. But you never lose your roots. And it, it's funny because where that pit was, there's a school now, Rickleton Primary School. And me and my brother are going in with the banner and doing a whole project with the children about what life was like in those times when the pit was there and what have you. Because that pit was around 300 years. It was from the 6th, 17th century it originated at first. It was there a long, long time. So, Bill, um, we're going to sing one of your grandfather's songs. Well, I don't think I need to now. We've we've heard it. Jal Jal was right. the one I was going to do. But so anyway, wait, wait, so so there's your dad there. So uh, I think we'll just round it up with that, Bill. That's fine. That's fine. I think it's gone very well. Well, thank you. I've I've really enjoyed it because yeah. Uh, yeah. it it's you'll appreciate it. it's it's like I'm very proud of that, and it brings back lots and lots of memories for me. Yeah. you know, from my upbringing. So how long it since your dad died? My dad died in two thousand and nine. Kevin. Yep, yep. Well, I never see my uncle there, and he's he lives in South Shields. I haven't seen him for a very long time. Still recording, so. Sorry, it's all right. So anyway, well, so we should we we'll switch it off. Yeah, <laughs> it's even not swearing. Right. <laughs> Good night, folks. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, t- <laughs> uh, clap harder. Clap harder. <laughs>